Please join me in welcoming your fellow alum, Key Schroeder. President Witten, distinguished administration and faculty, fellow Coles College graduates, family and friends, I could not be more honored to be here today. The story of Kennesaw State University, its evolution from commuter college to research university, and its importance to our community cannot be overstated. We should all be very proud to be connected to KSU's journey. I started my college career in the fall of 1991 and finished my undergraduate degree swiftly, just as planned by some time in 2006. <laughs> I had become the first in my family to take 15 years to get a bachelor's degree. Uh, you can imagine the comfort and pride I instilled in my parents. First, I majored in broadcast communications at the State University of New York at Oswego and quickly prioritized my role as the college radio station's program director well ahead of my academics, not unlike many of you here today. Bands like Nirvana and Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and the Smashing Pumpkins and Rage Against the Machine and Tool spoke to me much more than Communications 101 or Introduction to Psychology. In 1993, with the delightful academic probation letter in hand and an offer to be a record promoter in New York City for $250 a week before taxes, I took the logical choice and departed for New York City. I left college without a degree, but with a feather in my cap, as part of a team who launched an FM radio station. We started something meaningful with fresh voices spanning the airwaves 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I learned that I love that feeling. At college, on the radio side of things, I lived in ignorant bliss. I believe that number one, that I was an influencer, selecting the next generation of music for young years across the country. And two, that once I got into the business, I'd live a rock star's existence, traveling from city to city, living out the soundtrack of my generation, supporting the voices of the alternative rock and punk scenes, redefining the rules, rocking the vote, MTV guy, future record exec, mover and shaker. In reality, I became a telemarketer. I was handed a script, a portfolio of records, and a list of radio station programmers and ta was tasked with doing whatever it took to get radio stations to play crummy records whose fan bases had moved on to new sounds and new scenes. Too green and too young and too frightened to fight the power, I quit within a month, dead broke, disappointed, without a next at age 19. I had another feather in my cap, though one that would define how I approach my adult life. I'd never do anything again that didn't resonate with my soul, regardless of the pain that would accompany the journey. Playing it safe was never going to be me. I approached my father, who, by the way, I conveniently forgot to tell that I dropped out of college, <coughs> that I was going to return to college. He's a career football and multi-sport coach, wildly respected athletics administrator, and I knew I'd learn a profound lesson from whatever his response was, which was, that's great, Keith. <laughs> and he paused and kept pausing and gave me a look that I'll never forget, and he's here today. Um, and he said without saying, you chose your path. You didn't include anyone in your decision. You're a solo artist now. Best of luck to you as an adult. And the feathers in my cap continued to mount. Own your own choices, live with the consequences, pay your own damn bills. <laughs> I didn't technically go back to college, but I did go back to the college town where my college was. <laughs> Close enough. I squatted at the house I lived in with my college buddies before dropping out, needed to do something to earn my keep. So while they were in school, I watched every last cooking show, did the food shopping, and had two hot meals a day on the table for everybody. Admini admittedly, and I can admit it now, my mother-in-law is here today as well. One of my roommates is now my wife of 24 years. We were indeed living together. Uh, <clears throat> and she seemed to see something in me that I wasn't seeing. I had achieved flow state. 
that feeling where time is meaningless, where you're blissfully and competently engaged in the task at hand. Cooking became my flow. And my wife asked me, have you ever considered being a chef? And my, honor, my, my honest answer was no. <laughs> no, I have not. Now imagine this. We had no internet, no way to do some quick research. And to be honest, I didn't even know what the word culinary meant, at least not fully. But this idea, me as a chef, started to sound and feel very, very right. So we hopped in a car, headed to the college library, and found a list of technical schools that included the School of Culinary Arts at the Art Institute of Atlanta. Atlanta had just been awarded the 1996 Olympic Games, and rumor had it that it was possible for people to both eat and pay rent south of the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, New York was not as kind to its young. So while I waited for my wife to graduate from college, I took a job as a waiter in Syracuse, New York, and drove 85 miles round trip in the snow to collect a few bucks to, to prepare for life as a southern line cook. By the second day of spring break 1994 here in Atlanta, we had our first grits, put 99 bucks down on a two bedroom apartment off of Delk and Powers Ferry Road in Marietta, had frozen daiquiris at Underground Atlanta, enjoyed a free concert at Piedmont Park, and saw the dogwoods in bloom, and signed up for culinary school. Life was on track. The flow continued through the two-year culinary school experience, and I lived and loved every single minute of being in kitchens, being around food, working in hotels and restaurants, and meeting the most diverse array of cooks and waiters and sommeliers and housekeepers and general managers, all passionate about being of service to guests and to one another. I had found my rock and roll, it was food. And I graduated at the top of my class, but there was this lingering haunting pain that I did not finish my four year degree. And as mentioned, it would take some time. There's a problem with youth and swagger and talent. You get so caught up in becoming good at what you do that you fail to see the broader picture around you. Am I making the person next to me better? Am I being helpful? Am I contributing to a common vision? Or I am one disjointed but entertaining highlight reel? It wasn't until I received a review that I failed to exhibit any proprietary interest in a small restaurant business that I began to reflect on the difference between being a great player and being a captain or a leader. I'd exhibited the hard work and practice to become excellent at culinary tasks, but failed to improve the culture of the restaurant I worked at. In fact, I likely made it worse. That feedback stuck with me, uh, had me reflecting on the culture of coaching and career and care that surrounded me as a child. Again, my father was not only a coach of championship teams, he prioritized the championing of young athletes' lives, knowing that the NFL wasn't going to be there for most, if not all, of his players. These players were going to become firefighters and teachers and bankers and business people. His job wasn't to win games, it was to teach his players how to live as contributors to organizations, to communities, to families, through the lessons they learn playing sports and being on teams. My mother was a passionate manager of medical records at a sizable public hospital on Long Island, and she taught exactitude. She understood that a misplaced punctuation mark or a misspelled medication name could mean life or death. I marveled at her precision at everything, from her impeccable sense of style to her intense focus at everything she touched. Reflection and time have reminded me that I'm the son of a great coach and a great manager, and they both started as an athlete and a technician, respectively. That truth deserves honoring now with two small, two, not, with not small, very large children, <laughs> two amazing children, <clears throat> an uncommonly supportive wife, and a small dose of maturity which does not surprise you, uh, started anew uh, three more times. First, I took some correspondence courses at the University of Iowa, and I didn't correspond. Uh, <laughs> then I took and finished a couple of core courses here at Kennesaw, and eventually found my way to a college tailored to my chef life and finished my degree in business management and economics from Empire State College in 2006. The degree mattered to me. It didn't help advance my cooking career, but study made me a better learner and teed me up to become a very intensely focused future entrepreneur. 
I fell in love with organizational behavior, micro and macroeconomics, behavioral economics, finance, accounting. I took and saved my notes. I had learned to love learning. I recognized that I was becoming an amalgamation of a unique blend of what I'd been taught and who had taught me. We do indeed become a collection of those who invest in us. I had learned that proprietary interest was a prerequisite, that caring like the owner cares creates ownership habits, and that study and learning habits were not to be constrained to the university environment, but woven throughout personal and professional life. That addiction to learning led me back here to KSU in 2008, where I shared an informational interview, much of what I'm sharing with you today. I thank Dr. Michael Salvador, the then director of the EMBA program, with allowing the first ever chef into the program. The beauty of the Coles, the Coles College culture is this. It does not follow the status quo, and neither do you. Indeed, because the school is evolving, it's inherently entrepreneurial. While it adheres to the accreditor's definition of what is a business school, it sings its tunes as it wishes. The school embodies its own rock and roll ethos. It's not like the pedigreed schools, and it doesn't care. It's great anyway, in ways that schools with addictions to their legacy can't offer. KSU is as shaped by its students as it is by its leadership. And it was that free-spirited approach to executive education that encouraged the formation of my company, High Road Ice Cream. The company was born of a business plan project here in the final term of the EMBA, and was thrust into reality via the dedicated coaching of professors like Dr. Gary Roberts, who chased me into the hallway after our first high road business plan, physically and passionately telling me, you have to do this, okay? He shook me. You'll make this real, promise. I said, Dr. Roberts, make what real? I showed up, I did my presentation, we're good to go. No, this high road thing, Dr. Roberts, it's just an academic business plan. No, you have to make it real. And within a couple of days, he had introduced me to the eternal energy and intellect and compassion of the recently deceased Dr. Charles Hofer. Convinced me that not only was entre entrepreneurship right for me and my team, but that it was sensible, mappable, navigable, and the most likely path to personal wealth and fulfillment for anyone, and he was passionate about this, who A, hasn't won the lottery, B, wasn't a movie star, C, wasn't a professional athlete, or D, wasn't expecting a giant inheritance. And that it was statistically likely that a guy like me, who skipped through failures, was more likely to come out on the winning end of things, so long as I did one thing, keep starting businesses. Dr. Hofer convinced us to compete in a number of highly reputable business plan competitions around the country, all while we were raising families, holding down full-time jobs, and going to graduate school full-time. That extra effort led us to the International New Ventures Competition at the University of Nebraska, where High Road, representing K Kennesaw State University against schools you might be familiar with, like Yale and Harvard, took home the championship prize. And in late of... And in late of March 2010, just a handful of weeks before sitting in the seats you're sitting in today, we incorporated High Road Craft Ice Cream at that Cracker Barrel right down the street uh, and got started building a small food manufacturing company. I'll speak briefly in financial terms only because it's how points are scored in business. In our first year with just a few employees and a small freezer box truck, we booked over $500,000 in revenue. Nine years later, we'll sell over $50 million in ice cream and are poised to grow to over $100 million in sales in the next couple of years. Thank you. Last September, we acquired our first business, Chow Bella Gelato, which is part of our portfolio today. High Road has been on the Inc. 5000 for the last three years and will likely join the list again for 2009. High Road was born at KSU. The KSU experience instilled some core lessons that have become structurally integral to how we run High Road today. Number one, you must be coachable. Business is infinitely turbulent and you must live in harmony with advisors and peers, 
at every level of your organization. Listen, act on feedback, apologize for slip-ups and outbursts. Business is a team sport. Become a better player every day, live for your team, and love your teammates. Number two, see the world. The KSU experience brought us to Romania, where we saw the seedlings of capitalism influencing a historically communist nation. That perspective cannot be replicated in books or on YouTube. Since then, I've been inspired to fill two passports seeking understanding around the world, and I return with new ice cream flavors, too. Number three, that entrepreneurship is a practical, a practical and reasonable life and career path. Listen to no one who suggests otherwise. It's not risky. It's smart to place bets on yourself. It's even smarter to place bets on yourself along with diverse and intelligent co-founders co and compatriots like my friend Adam Hayes, who is here today. It's a visceral and satisfying way to live out a professional life. Four, governance matters. This is the nerdy academic stuff, I'm sorry. Don't wait to be part of a Fortune 100 company to create or be part of a board of directors. Seek to surround yourself with character and wisdom and strength and serve your board, and it will serve you. And when time and experience allow in your life, serve on a board of directors, whether for profit or for not. Board members are professional listeners as much as they are advisors. Number five, refuse to quit. Each successive terrifying moment where you come out on the other end alive should embolden you to keep going regardless of result. Own your failures, let them soak into you, and emerge with ways to stick and move like never before. And importantly, number six, don't become your job. Surround yourself with advisors and colleagues and friends who encourage the things that make you whole, whether it's travel or hip hop or rock climbing or mixology. These interests make you more interesting to other people, more likely to build meaningful relationships in life and in business. This hustle culture that people play up is overplayed, boring, and unhealthy. Be whole, take care of yourselves. The riches of the High Road Craft ice cream experience add up as names and faces and lifelong relationships, not dollars, though. Go get that job, for sure, but don't do anything that inhibits the complete Brilliant, diverse, quirky, rebellious, unique you from emerging in this lifetime. Congratulations, graduates. I know how hard you've worked. You got it done way faster than I did. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to share this moment with you. Congratulations. <laughs>